introduce you to a uh, sculptor, artist, jeweler, teacher, uh, Jim Sardonis, who is a local artist here from Randolph, um, and the designer and creator of Whale Dance, which is just a mile down the road. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear okay? Okay, well, I do have um, a short film on the making of the whale dance sculpture. This is the sculpture that I made 30 years ago, which used to be in the same location and is now in South Burlington. It was sold and moved there 20 years ago after spending its first 10 years on the same site as the new ones. Um, but I thought I would just show a little more about some of the other work that I do. I don't just do whale's tails, but um, I'll show you the last 20 years or so, I've kind of focused on public art so that um, it is placed often in universities, aquariums, libraries, places like that where um, public can have access to the work, which I, I enjoy more people being able to enjoy the work, hopefully. Um, but I started out just as a high school student um, taking a, a sculpture class, which was offered. I went to uh, Phillips Exeter Academy, which happened to offer sculpture. I would have never thought to do it otherwise, but I took the class and fell in love with the whole process of making traditional type sculpture, which meant using clay, plaster, wood, and stone. Um, this was in the late 60s when um, lots of newer materials were being used, like plastics and other things. Um, and when I went to college, I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, and I majored in uh, studio art and art history. But my teachers, <coughs> studio art teachers, couldn't understand why I wanted to work with something like stone that, in their eyes, had been done as well as it could be done 500 years before when we had all this new material to work with. But I was always drawn um, to, to these natural materials and the natural forms of human, animal, and plant uh, subject matter. So that's pretty much what I've focused on and started out just doing my own work, mostly on a small scale, until um, I had the opportunity to do a large piece, which I'll show you at the end here. That was in 1981. Um, so this was the piece that is titled Reverence, um, and the one that used to be in Randolph. It ended up inside and on the cover of this art history textbook. Um, some of my work comes from competitions that I enter around the country. This one is in Raleigh, North Carolina at the North Carolina State Veterinary College. And I proposed this um, called Swimming Retriever along the lines of the whale's tails where one has to imagine the earth the grass or whatever material um, has a water surface. And I wasn't sure they would go for it, but I decided to, and they ended up loving the idea. The, the head of the retriever is a gold-colored granite, and the stick in its mouth is bronze, so it was a matter of attaching that, and it's, the stick is used as a bench people sit on front of the veterinary hospital there. How big is it? It's, um, the stick is seven feet wide, and the head is about 10 feet long. So it's made for children to climb on as well as people to sit on the stick. And it was, <clears throat> these competitions, usually there's 
a budget, um, either because they're a part of the percent for art law that a lot of states have where a new building is required to spend 1% of the budget on art, or as in this case, um, fellow donated a lot of money uh, to this veterinary college and his entire family consisted of five golden retrievers. <laughs> and he used to like bringing them to this hospital. And when he died, he left something like $24 million to the hospital, which is partly how they built this state-of-the-art hospital. But they wanted to honor him. So they put this competition out there that I entered. And um, when people enter these competitions, you show them what you've done, and from those, they pick four or five finalists from whom they ask for a specific proposal. And I was one of um, four finalists, and this was my proposal, and thankfully they ended up liking it. So that's how that happened. Um, this is up in Burlington um, at Champlain College. It's kind of my interpretation of the explorer Samuel de Champlain. Um, and this piece is in bronze on a granite pedestal. Uh, I made three or four different models in different positions. And the in this case, the donor of the money that they had for this, um, as well as the president of the college, chose from the, the models that I presented, small ones kind of along these lines, and that's, that's the one they liked. This is um, a group of polar bears carved out of Bethel white granite that comes right down the road. It's in Andover, Massachusetts. There was a library that wanted something as a focal point for readings on the environment and also for children to climb on. So I proposed this idea of the time the polar bears were in the news with the whole climate change and the water, the uh, ice, polar ice caps receding and melting. So that was uh, something that they ended up liking as well. Sorry, I put the wrong thing here. This was a, another competition up in Maine at the University of Maine at Presque Isle. And I didn't realize that uh, Mainers are very much into fiddlehead ferns, just like a lot of Vermonters are. Apparently, they keep their patches secret from everybody. <laughs> um, but I proposed this bench that uses um, giant-sized fiddlehead ferns, um, partly to look a little bit, to me, like a, a family. Um, and this is in the lobby of a new fitness building that they were building for the university, but it was also open to the public, so felt like it might be a, a nice idea for kind of community support. This is a, a group of dolphins. Uh, family Families are often a theme of mine. And <clears throat> on the other side that you can't see is the ocean. I, I would have placed it a little differently if I had been involved in the pouring of the concrete foundations, which they did before I got down there in uh, Fairhope, Alabama. But I always think of the photos like this. I'd rather have seen the ocean in the background than, than those trees. But that's how they placed it. Uh, this is up at St. Michael's College. They, um, a donor there wanted to honor, well, both 
kind of commemorate the um, St. Michael, you know, which the school is named after, but also three or four of their students died in the 9-11 um, catastrophe in New York, so this, this was also in honor of them. Ammonites, which are the fossil forerunners to nautilus shells, um, were around up to 400 million years ago. And this um, is a bench that I made out of a chunk of black marble that comes from uh, one of the Champlain Islands, um, where in the stone I found many fossils that look very much like this. Uh, but it's at the University of Vermont in uh, the geology building. And at the time, my daughter was a student at UVM, and I proposed that they uh, trade me tuition for the sculpture, <laughs> which I often try to do with my work. I do a lot of bartering and have gotten things from uh, antique cars to fine wine from people. Did they take you up on it? They did, yeah. Yeah, I ended up not really spending the money on the tuition, but that's what it was supposed to be for. This is um, a piece that's made out of the same Champlain black marble uh, from Isle Lamont. And it was a, a competition for an elementary school in Maine. And I proposed this little family of bears. Um, so happens my oldest friend who grew up across the street from me in Nashua, New Hampshire, uh, was a first grade teacher in this school. So she got to, I, I got to visit there in, in her classroom. Sorry, the quality isn't that great on these photos, but th this is also another bear family, which is at the Dartmouth Medical Center. And I was contacted by a couple from Hanover who, rather than have a big 50th anniversary celebration, they wanted uh, me to create something which they donated to the children's uh, ward in the hospital at Dartmouth. And this is what I came up with. It's meant for the kids who are patients there to climb on and have a little fun while they're there for not so fun things. Some of you may have been on Braintree Hill where the Braintree Meeting House is, just a few miles from here, but in 1991 I, I made this panther family. Um, turns out back in the 1800s, um, panthers were quite a, a popular thing in, in Braintree in particular. There was a lot written about them. and. Um, in fact, in the museum, um, historical museum in Randolph, is a footprint that was cast in plaster from an actual print in a farm field in Braintree um, that was confirmed by the New York Natural History Museum um, as a panther footprint, um, which I used and, and looked at, but. Um, that was one of the reasons the community that was in on deciding what they wanted me to make chose this idea. After I made those whale's tails in Randolph 30 years ago, 1989, um, an architect friend of mine from Warren, Vermont, who went to Yale and um, was having a 30th anniversary, um, not anniversary, but reunion. Um, they had a classmate named Bart Giamatti 
who had been the president of Yale as well as commissioner of baseball at, at this time. And they, as a class gift, wanted to do something in his honor. So he had seen the whale's tails, which he loved, and asked me if I would work with him uh, to create this big granite bench, which is on the campus there at Yale. Unfortunately, Bart Giamatti died while I was making it. He never got to see it, although he knew it was happening. We're getting down to the, the last few here. Um, this was just a, a photo that I took shortly after the original tales were in there, which I liked before any grass grew, but. Um, and just a few years before that, sorry, I'm not used to this. In front of the Gifford Medical Center, um, I made this family, I called Vermont family. At the time, my wife and I had a little baby who died and um, we suggested we felt as though we were given such wonderful family care um, that we, I, I proposed the idea of a family sculpture to kind of symbolize the care that the hospital provided. And thankfully they, they went along with uh, raising the funds for me to do that, which included going to Carrara, Italy to buy this marble, which, um, beautiful marble. Unfortunately, it is not the greatest stone uh, for being outdoors anymore now that we have acid rain um, raining on it. But, and then the very first large piece I ever did is right by the floating bridge in Brookfield. It's a pair of hippos called Father and Son. My father had just died and my son had just been born. So I named it that um, also because everybody always assumes it's a mother and child. <laughs> and this is also the Bethel white granite. And at the time I didn't have a studio. Um, the fellow who commissioned this let me work in a field that he had <laughs> that once I plunked it down on the ground, I wasn't able to move it until I was done. So I had to lay on the ground to do the the lower parts. And because I was teaching at the time, I thought it would be a great summer project, but it ended up taking three summers for me to finish it um, in those conditions. Is the Bethel White hard to work? They say it's the hardest granite. Yeah, I would say it's not the hardest granite, but it's very hard. All granites are, are hard compared to marble. It's another much harder level. So do you use electric tools? Yeah, you I mean, you know, people have carved granite, but I look at the Egyptian sculptures, which are some of my favorite, and can't believe that, I don't know how they did it, but, you know, they, they carved these beautiful, beautiful things out of, uh, in fact, one of my favorite pieces is at the museum, uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It's a head of a queen and it's this yellow jasper is the stone. It's broken right in half, so the top is broken off, and the bottom has these beautiful lips carved and the chin and polished granite. And I remember reading that when they got that in the museum, they didn't have anything in the museum that could drill a hole in it so they could mount it. And here, this thing had been carved thousands of years ago so beautifully and expertly. So maybe we'll, uh, Bonnie, if you could switch over to. Well, Jim, I want to make a note. Yeah. I told me you had the picture of father and son in the water. Oh, when yeah. When Irene came through. Yeah, well, there, oh. Irene came through and uh, the water level covered the grass so that it looked like the sculpture was in the water. And, uh, it's kind of a nice sight. I'm glad it didn't stay that way. Yeah. Come on. Mm -hmm. 
get that to I'm full gonna, screen. Yeah, let me get the other one out of here first, I think. Okay. Jim, I had a question about the, um, the sculpture with the dog and the stick outside yeah. the veterinarian school. Did you know the story of the donors? Mm -hmm. Tell us being that brief when you chose that? Yes. When I was chosen as a finalist, um, typically finalists go oh. to the place and learn, you know, meet the committee and see where the sculpture will be placed and um, talk to people about whatever they might have in mind. In this case, it wasn't that they had anything like this in mind. It was just my idea and my um, the fact that I like to use other surfaces as water, imaginary water surfaces. Um, but I did learn that he had all these golden retrievers. He had a house with a pool for them to swim in. And he left money for uh, the woman who was taking care of the last of his dogs that were still alive, who, who was living there when I went down there. Um, with the, and I met two, two or three of his golden retrievers that came. I think we're all set. Okay, we're so yeah, this is the, the short film and we'll have time for questions about this or, or the other things after. Yeah, in 1980, uh, after I had been working with the kids in school making projects related to whales, I had a dream um, and I woke up from the dream um, and the dream was that I was standing on a beach looking out at the water when these two whales' tails came up out of the water. And I remember seeing the water cascading off of the tails, um, watching them. And when I awoke, I realized that was something I was going to need to do in some form of a sculpture. And originally I thought it might make a good fountain with water coming off of them. But I later decided it would be better to use the earth, whatever surface it might be on, grass or otherwise, as a, an imaginary ocean surface so that people could get right up to the pieces and actually touch them and feel the scale of, of whales. Um, I figured out that I could make each tail in two pieces and with steel pins and epoxy attach the flukes on top of the vertical part of the tail, which is what I did and, and uh, which is the piece called Reverence that ended up spending 10 years on the Exit 4 site in Randolph, which belonged to this guy whose name is David Threlkeld. After 10 years on this site, the owner found he had to sell both the land and the sculpture. A group of people in South Burlington um, who owned Technology Park ended up buying it from them and hired me to move them from Randolph to Burlington. You know, the Preservation Trust was formed in 1980 and the whale's tails, the original uh, sculpture was installed in 1989 and it was here until 1999. And as part of my job, um, all these years, I've done a lot of traveling around the state, really um, been to just about every community in the state, traveled Interstate 89 a lot. Um, I would often stop along the way because every time I stopped and had a chance to have a look at uh, the sculpture, I would just sit there and smile. It was so surprising, it was so wonderful to just come upon this incredible sculpture popping out of the field um, in this very unlikely location. Um, it was uh, a very special experience. 
And then when um, the sculpture was sold and it moved to uh, Chittenden County, um, it was it was a very sad day, frankly. It was. Um, you know, kind of a metaphor of what's happening in Vermont, you know, that all good things move to Chittenden County. And we've got to make every effort in this state to make sure that communities all over the state can be successful. And Paul Bruin and the Preservation Trust helped to get the land conserved. And at that point, asked me about the possibility of doing another sculpture. Um, and at, at this point in time, I had decided I was no longer planning to work in stone, uh, but that I would love to make something in bronze, which would be along the lines of the original, but a little different design. Bronze casting is um, a process that involves collaborating with a, a foundry, in, in this case, the Polish Talix foundry in New York was one of the only ones capable of casting something this large. Um, so I worked with them first by experimenting on a small scale with little plaster models. And I made these out of uh, wire and screen and cardboard um, and applied plaster over the surface um, and made probably 10 different versions of, of these tails in different sizes until I came up with the one that I felt would be the best for the large scale. At that point, um, I sent these models to the foundry and they were able to use them to enlarge in foam um, by a digital scan of my, my models so that the size of the pieces uh, were exactly what I wanted, which was 16 feet tall and about 12 feet wide across the flukes. Um, once they roughed out these foam patterns, um, I was able to go and work on the foam, get it a little bit uh, more to my liking, and then a layer of metal screen was applied on top of the foam and uh, about three quarters of an inch of plaster on top of that. And from those patterns, uh, molds were made in sand. And the pieces were cast in about I would say six different pieces, each one. After they were cast, they were welded together and ground down, finished um, what they call chasing of the bronze um, to get the smooth surface I was after.
finally the patina, which is the application of chemicals with a torch that oxidize on the surface to make a color that uh, can be anything from green, brown, black, as well as other colors. I was looking for mostly black with a little bit of green showing through in places. opportunity to to do it again it's not I, I didn't think of it as doing the same thing again because they are quite different but obviously they're they're both two whales tails but um, I felt like I had had a lot of years to to think about what I had done originally and what I might like to do again not really thinking I'd ever have the chance so it was uh, incredible to have this opportunity to uh, try again. This sculpture, the original sculpture, and we hope this sculpture um, will be one of those things that will contribute, help contribute to um, the efforts that are going on in this community. Uh, to um, build a stronger downtown and village center up on the, on the hill. Sculpture, sculpture in general really affects me at least, and I think others. Um, it makes you stop for just a moment from our crazy days um, where we're all running around dealing with all the things that we have to deal with in our lives, and then all of a sudden you see this sculpture and you stop for a moment and smile and calm down a little bit and have a little bit of respite in a busy day. Trust unfortunately passed away just two months after the sculpture was done. So it was 
so happy he got to see it in place on the last project he ran again. So if anybody has any questions about any of that, feel free to ask. I've been thinking you when we're, I'm, we're driving by the by them, and I wonder what you think when you drive by them. You know, are you riveted? Do you stare? And do I, you I probably stop there more than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of thrilling for me to have them back there again, but uh, I'm also checking on them. Unfortunately, discovered the first graffiti on them. Oh. Oh. Somebody wrote with some red marker, which shouldn't be too hard to get off, but um, it's one of the fears I've had. Um, but that's, you have to take that Was chance. Was that a decision about the lighting at night? I wondered how they're not lit at night, and I wondered if some of that's to protect them, or would, I don't know. Well, I don't know either. I, I At one point, I know uh, I was told I wasn't at the meeting, but there was a community meeting in Randolph before the sculpture was done. And they knew there was going to be it up there. And someone thought I had told them, which I didn't, you know, that it was going to be lit. And apparently there was quite an uproar <laughs> from the people there about having it lit um, up here. I don't, I don't see why. Not it, want it no, they didn't, they didn't like the idea at all. I don't know why, because McDonald's certainly is <laughs> well lit. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe it's, uh, you know, at this point, there's not money, you know, there to do more with it, you know, whether it's lighting or, or otherwise. And it, the plan originally by the Preservation Trust was to offer the sculpture and the land that's on to the town of Randolph, which they did, and the town turned it down. Um, not exactly sure why, but uh, they didn't want the, the maintenance, which was very little needed, but there's like scrubbing a little bit. Off of <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I wonder if the camera on there could help with the yeah. rest of the handle. Yeah, maybe, um, but we'll have to you, see. Do you and Mary Lewis know each other? Um, no. You look familiar. Yeah, but, but she wrote the most beautiful home prayer. I tried to find it. I, I want to send you a copy. I've got yeah, I'd love to. You do? <laughs> because I could, I mean, I've just retired, so I'm between a, a, my previous computer and my home computer, and they're not at all communicating. <laughs> I couldn't find it, but I, I did. I dedicated it to you. I and you wrote about that, the God. sculpture? Or? Um, yes. I happened to be praying in church that Sunday after um, the event at Chandler, mm -hmm. and I um, did it up for the did you create the table that's in the foyer of the hospital? Yes, I did. Yeah. Good guess. Not too many other whale tail guys around. But yeah, I made that. Um, I made two of them. Um, one of them belongs to a friend and, and Barry. If you haven't seen it in the lobby of the hospital or two bronze tails that form a table with a piece of glass on top. It's in the waiting room there in the lobby of the hospital. I'm curious if you, how you think of the, uh, the whales. Uh, are they, um, since you, you know you did the father and the son, yeah. and um, the family, and I mean, are they friends? Are they siblings? <laughs> are they, what are they? Do you have a, do you have a thought about them? Is what yeah, I, I think of them as a, a couple or a, a pair, uh, okay. and the the reason they're placed the way they are is because I think of the rest of the bodies underneath and how they relate to each other, and in this case, I, I think of it as a hug, that they're parts that you can't see. If you can imagine them extending and curving the way that the tails do, below the surface they would be touching. Uh, the whales do that? I think they do. I, I, I think they do that. I don't know that they do it exactly like this, but in other yeah. orientations, certainly with 
young ones, you see lots of caressing and um, touching of each other. So I, I don't think it's too big of a stretch to think that they might not do something like that. Jim, when you go to a foundry where the um, where it's created, do the workers feel like they're part of this creation? Yeah. I mean, are they more than just workers? Are they craftsmen? Oh, yeah. Are they Men, most of them are curious. sculptors. Yeah. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm it's, curious about that. Yeah, because lots, they, lots they are of, part of the creation. Oh, yeah. A lot, lots of uh, sculpture background and uh, people who are artists in their own right, but it's a one of the few jobs you know artists can can do and get a regular paycheck for. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them you know do work in that arena. But they were very very uh, appreciative and, and really liked the sculpture, which made me feel good. This foundry in New York um, does work for most of the big name artists in in the country and, and around the world. Um, so I was, I felt lucky to be, be able to have work done there in the top, top notch place. Did, did they, they ever see them? Oh. Well, I sent them the photos, oh, yeah. Now, they have a team that does the installation, which I hired them to do. Um, but I, I've sent lots of photos to them. And did they commission you, the sculptor, or does the sculptor commission a foundry? How does that work? Yeah, the sculpture, the sculptor um, commissions the foundry. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll get a, a quotation of what it's going to cost to do all the stuff that's needed, the making of the mold, the casting, the patina, and in this case, the delivery and installation. So that's usually quite a large mm -hmm. figure. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't include anything for me, so mm -hmm. that's how things are, at least how I price things, knowing what it's going to cost me out of my pocket to get this thing done. I have to get reimbursed for that as well as my time that I'm putting in. Yes. What's the average time it takes you to do a piece? Um, most of the large pieces I've done have been between six and nine months. Um, this was basically a year's project, although I wasn't working on it constantly. Somebody there was, was mostly working on it throughout the year. Um, but the, the original tales, the reverence piece that I carved out of granite, I spent nine months working every day on it. Do you have any future projects? I'm hoping, you know, I, I never know if the one that I last do is going to be the last one I get to do. <laughs> but, um, I have a design for one, and I have some interest, but I have not got a firm commitment yet. But if I get to do it, um, it is a, a very different um, design for a, a whale's tail that's not doesn't have the vertical part it's just the flukes at a diagonal but it would be 25 feet across which would be the size of a blue whale the largest whale so that's what I'm hoping I get to do but I don't know that I will yes. are you going to tell us about the frog oh yeah and I, meant, and I, and I have another <coughs> little like short it. If, I it up. Well, I was going to say, if you could get back to uh, to, the, to my little other thing there, I've got okay. another short yeah. little yeah. thing we could show. If, if anybody who needs or wants to leave well. now, feel free to. But I have a I'm on. this frog, which is up at the uh, new Vermont Agriculture and Environmental Laboratory, was another competition, the most recent one, that I entered and won. And so I put on here my presentation to the committee um, to kind of show how I go about trying to get work. Um, in this case, it worked out. You know, you have to try a lot of times, and most of the time it doesn't work out. But every so often, it does. And uh, in this case, my 
little model, which was this size. Um, it was made out of plaster originally. Um, I photographed it, and my son, who's great with computers and digital art, you know, helps me in these situations, like that dog with the stick in his mouth. I had a photo of the model and a photo of where it was going to go, and my son made it look like it was already there and people sitting on it. And, you know, he could do that part, but he helped. Uh, I originally proposed that they put this in the lobby of the laboratory, but they decided they really would prefer to have it outside. So the photo that I had him help me with showed my model with it inside of the lab. But one of the, one of the main things that the laboratory does is water testing around the state. And um, this was partly what made me propose this idea because frogs being the fact that they absorb everything through their skin um, are, can be the, the ones that um, forecast a, a problem with contaminants. I think we need to take this out and add it again okay. Okay. in order for it to, it won't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's not showing. We've added it, come on. So I, I kind of referred to it as the canary in the coal mine in that when frogs start to uh, have problems, which they already are in many places, uh, becoming deformed and you know, it's typically from chemicals that have, have gotten into the to the water. So it's that V A E L, yeah. So once I was chosen as a finalist and I decided this is what I wanted to propose, um, I put this together to show the committee um, on the night that the finalists were proposing their ideas. And was yours the only frog that was proposed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were there yeah, there were some great ideas, and um, again, I because some of these things require people to use their imagination. That that's not really water that the frog is sitting in. You have to imagine that it is. I'm never quite sure whether people are going to go with it or not, but um, it's been so far so good. Same with the, the dog. I almost didn't propose that. Um, several of the finalists with that North Carolina State piece was, you know, proposed the guy who left the money with his dogs around him. And the committee told me that he was someone who very much would have preferred my idea and not wanting to be in the foreground. He was very much someone who liked to be in the background. And on the back of that dog, um, I made a what looked like a dog tag uh, on his collar that had the fellow's portrait and his name and, and dates on it. So you could find who it was. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, this is just, you know, a series of, of slides, some of which may be redundant, but um, so I can, I'll read them so you don't have to. My work is inspired by natural forms, human, plant, and animal. Um, this is the Champlain piece that I showed you earlier. Same with the fiddleheads showing human and plant and um, the animal. I didn't show at the time all examples of my work, so I put a few of these in. Um, and then one of the themes in my work has been to use other surfaces such as grass, brick, etc., as imaginary water. This forces viewers to imagine unseen parts below the surface. Yeah, this being an example of, of that.
this was a, a piece that was commissioned by a fellow who saw the, uh, the whale's tails in Burlington. And he happened to have gone on a sailing trip with his wife um, from started on the East Coast and ended up west in the Marshall Islands. And they, they came upon a typhoon, which they knew was going to happen. And they sailed into a harbor and, and decided to spend the night there. And they were invited to join the local people in the, in the town hall, but they wanted to make sure the boat was OK. So they stayed on the boat. And in the middle of the night, it changed direction and came right through this harbor. And the boat was destroyed, and his wife was lost. Um, he was washed up. And he wanted a memorial to her, um, having seen the, the two of mine. Um, so I made one similar that has a engraving on the side of a, of a little poem that he had written. But he wrote a book about the whole experience called Dark Wind, which I have. You can find it, I'm sure, um, if you're interested. And this um, being the original one, this is now where they are in Burlington. This is my favorite view, which is if you're traveling south on 89, you get to see the hills in the background more like you did when they were here. So this, my proposal for this site was inspired by the next photo taken by Vermont author and photographer Mary Holland. The head of a male green frog emerges from the water and the rest of the body is unseen below the surface, substituting approximately 64 blue tiles for the gray tiles that they had planned for the lobby. A bronze, a bronze frog's head between three and four feet tall and four to five feet wide will sit in the middle of the blue tiles as if in water. This is the photo that I went to a presentation that this woman, Mary Holland, she's written several great books on nature. One of them is um, called Naturally Curious. Um, but she's a fantastic photographer as well as a writer. I highly recommend finding her books. Uh, one of them goes through every day of the year and tells you what's happening in nature in Vermont. Re re relating to different animals, plants, birds, beautiful photos, and, and very interesting work. Anyway, I saw this photo at her presentation, and I said, I'm going to make a sculpture like that. So this came along. And my design highlights one of the most important functions of the VAEL, which is to test waterways for dangerous pollutants. Guy Roberts, the director, had this to say when I asked whether the lab <coughs> tests lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams. Yes, we test all the surface waters you, you mentioned for nutrient runoff from fa farms and acid deposition that drifts from out of state. Of the 30,000 samples we test per year, this type of testing accounts for about two-thirds of the work, so it's a very important focus of the lab. A huge percentage of our work ultimately helps protect our surface waters since they're connected to so many Vermont activities. Can't seem to get it to change here. Well, that's OK. I was just talking about uh, why I felt like it was a good idea. <laughs> and here's the little model that my son made up for me with a, a child there to kind of show the scale. Um, but if you take a, you could probably almost walk from here up there. You can see it out in front of the 
entrance to the building there. I think that's all that I have here. I think that's the end anyway. So um, anyone else who has questions, you're welcome to, to ask. Was the frog cast uh, here in Randolph Center? No, Bob, Bob Wright has cast um, things for me. I've worked for many years with a friend of mine who has a foundry in West Rutland. And I had already kind of committed to having him do, do this at the time. but. Uh, Bob's doing a great job. It's great to have his foundry here. He casts some of these small ones for me. Um, right, right now he's doing some. How thick are, is the bronze on the wheel stands, and are there indeed reinforcing rods inside? The 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 bottom of each of the uh, bottom sections has a framework of stainless steel um, which is welded inside of the, of the bottom and then eight inch legs extend down to, to the foundation. So they're bolted in. They were bolted in first and then we filled in eight inches of dirt up to the base of the sculpture. So before the sculpture came, the first thing was to, uh, had to demolish the top layer of the old foundation that had been there originally, just because it had been there for 30 years and these were a little larger, so the shape of the foundation needed to be different. So we broke up the concrete, then poured a new pad, um, and I tried to keep track of where the rebar was in the cement knowing that we'd be drilling holes to attach these, not wanting to hit the, the rebar. So you might have seen one of the shots of my daughter helping draw red lines on the concrete, which corresponded to where the rebar was, so that when the fellow came to install, he came a few days early with the bolts, which he drilled um, according to our patterns that we had left there to avoid the uh, rebar. And then a couple of days later, after the bolts had been epoxied into the cement, they were able to just lower it down. And luckily, they lined up the way they were supposed to and just put nuts and washers on and tighten it up. So it's bronze is very, very strong by itself. Um, and they have engineers who had to approve the design um, and decide whether it needed extra reinforcement inside, which it might have, but they decided it didn't. So, how, how thick is it? so the bronze itself is about a half an inch thick. Um, something this small is a little less than that, but something that size typically is about three eighths to a half an inch thick. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who's responsible for them now? Who owns them? Randolph? They still are owned by the Preservation Trust. Uh, whether they will gift them to another entity, I hope they'll maybe try again with Randolph. And, you know, having seen that it is somewhat of a draw for for the town that maybe they'll be more receptive to the idea. But the other thing is uh, possibly the state of Vermont they may give it to. They have, they have the responsibility because this frog came through uh, the Art in Public Buildings program. That means that this, among many other public art pieces, are the responsibility of the state to maintain. So they will be coming here to do the maintenance on the frog. And I was suggesting that perhaps they'd want to take these as well. So we'll see. It's not really up to me at this point, but um, I hope that there'll be someone in charge of maintaining them, which simply means 
applying a coat of wax twice a year to keep the patina the same as it is now. When you do nothing, it ends up turning that green color that you see on a lot of old bronzes or copper roofs, um, which doesn't look so bad, but it starts eating into the metal. So it really needs to have that little bit of maintenance, which is really about a day's work for one or two people. Did Randolph give a, re give a reason why they were rejecting it? Um, I, I wasn't there at the meeting, but I think you know part of it was the maintenance. Part of it, I think, you know, was they felt like they're getting some benefit without having to do anything. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I think it ha happened to be the particular uh, makeup of the select board and the and the town manager that felt they didn't want to do it. Anyway, thanks again for coming.